We've been endeavouring over the last few years to try and make virtual geological education more real, if you like. And I'll talk to you about a variety of different techniques that we utilise. I'd like to illustrate that in the context of some virtual tours that we produced recently. And I suppose we'd better make a start then. So first of all, what am I going to talk about? Well, I'll talk a bit first about why virtual tours anyway. Why, would, why the hell would we do this? I'll talk about the range of comparatively immersive resources that we can utilize to make virtual tours. I'll talk a bit about what open access resources are already available. And I'll talk about how we go about building tours and I'll provide you with some examples of tours. Okay, so moving onwards then, why the hell would we want to do virtual tours? Well, there are a whole heap of issues that impact upon our ability to look at geology, particularly in an educational context. There are issues of distance. I can't readily take my students from Tasmania to look at the rocks in the East Pilbara. Similarly, those in Western Australia can't look at rocks in Cape York. And so there's issue, issues of distance, there's the associated issue of cost. There's also issue of access, where there are many areas where access is difficult or prohibited or restricted. And increasingly, there are issues of OHS. So that's why virtual tours are potentially important. What applications do they have? Well, I'm a, I'm a tertiary educator, but I also get involved in secondary education and clearly virtual tours have applications in this field. I wanna stress at the outset though, that real, real field trips are best. They, nothing can fully replace the experience of being in the field, but virtual, the ability for us to be able to utilize virtual material provides us with greater diversity of student experiences. I believe that virtual tours also have a place in professional education, where at a given locality, we can educate new staff in the characteristics of local geology, or we could familiarize staff from um, in a new geological environment without having to necessarily go there. And finally, of course, there's the, the aspect of geological outreach, geotourism, all of these sorts of things, whereby with these things, we can very effectively showcase Australia's amazing geological heritage. But I suppose in a very immediate sense, the thing that makes virtual tours so important is the thing on the left-hand side, which we all know. And during the last year, particularly those of us in, second, in tertiary education have had to take this into account in the delivery of our geological education programs. Okay, so I'm, I've been someone who's been making virtual tours for a long time. This is an example of a virtual tour I produced way back in 2002. It's interactive, as you can see, it's just a screen grab coming up there. It's non-linear, meaning that students can explore it in any way. It's composed here, however, of primarily flat imagery. So it's useful, and we still use this tour for our first year geology students. It's useful, but it's not really immersive or engaging for the students. And what we really need to be able to incorporate to make things immersive and engaging is we need to be able to incorporate more three-dimensional content and 360-degree content to make it more real. And that's really what I'd like to talk about. So virtual tours aren't new. You know, we've been developing them here for 20 odd years and other people even before that. But there's been an explosion in our ability to be able to do this in an immersive way in recent times. So what virtual resources do we have available to us? that we can utilize to build virtual tours. We have 360 degree images that I'll show you a little, in a little while and I'll talk about how we acquire those. There are 3D models. And again, I'll talk a bit about the 3D model production process. These 3D models are geometrically correct. They are texturally correct so that they are photorealistic three-dimensional three models that can be rotated and spun on the screen as you'll see. We also have conventional video and increasingly 360 degree video, and I'll show you some examples of that later. In addition to that, we have high resolution imagery. When I say high resolution, I'm not talking merely 20 or 30 megapixels, I'm talking hundreds of megapixels to gigapixel type imagery. And finally, of course, we have all the conventional resources that would be associated with any sort of um, normal geological tour, if you like, maps and documents. And we take all of those resources and we integrate them to form virtual tours, an example of the front page of which is shown there from our first year teaching program. So how do we generate some of this 360 degree imagery? Well, if you'd gone back a few years ago, then we would have generated 360 degree imagery with equipment such as that shown on the screen. 
um, whereby we use the DSLR camera and the panorama head, or maybe a robotic camera head to make really high resolution 360 degree imagery. In many ways, these are still the best images. However, in the last few years, there's been a revolution in camera technology, if you like. So now we can off the shelf buy 360 degree cameras that work exceptionally well. And the three that we use in our work here are illustrated here. They range in terms of both price and capability as illustrated there. And these things are amazing. Basically, you can take them out into the field with one press of the button, you'll acquire a full 360 degree view. And the one I'm using most commonly at the moment is the one on the far right hand side, which acquires every single press of the button, it acquires 134 megapixel image of the 360 surrounds that you're located in. And the cost isn't prohibitive at $1,300. That's not an enormous cost for something such as this. So there's been a revolution in our ability to be able to capture 360 degree scenes, which are essential for making good virtual tours. How do we make 3D models? We make 3D models primarily through the process of photogrammetry, merely taking photos of an outcrop from many localities, getting clever computer software to match those photos and to generate the geometry of the object. Then we can make a triangulated model as shown on the left-hand side and finally attach the texture to it. And what we end up with is a fully texture rendered photorealistic rendition of the geological outcrop, which we can also place fully in three dimensional coordinate systems so that this is not merely geometrically correct, but it is geographically correct as well. So we can actually do real things like make measurements on these, on these 3D objects. One of the very important things, again, that has come out in the last 10 years or so is the, our ability to do things with drones. And what drones provide us is the ability to see a geological site from a completely different perspective and a very often a very illuminating perspective in the same way that aerial photography has traditionally offered geoscientists a different perspective on the Earth's surface. Drones do the same thing, but at a much closer scale. And so with drones, what can we generate? We can generate a range of objects. We can do conventional 2D images, a range of high, D, high definition video, we can take many photographs and make three-dimensional models. We can turn those models into ortho images from any direction. And we can also collect 360 degree images. And I'll illustrate some of these later in the talk when I showcase some tours. So what I'd like to do before I go on and show you some tours and how we build tours is just talk a little bit about the fact that in Australia, we're fortunate to have some really useful virtual resources. And I'd like to highlight a couple of those. The first of these is the Ausgeol resource, which I was principal in constructing. The Ausgeol resource, which can be accessed at the website there, provides access to over three and a half thousand localities around Australia, each of which have comprehensive metadata as shown here. This is running at about three times full speed, but we've looked up folds at Malakuta and now brought up on the screen an individual, um, an individual fold hinge from the, from the beach near Malakuta so that we can view it. But the Ausgeol website also has a spatial interface so that these three and a half thousand localities can be accessed. We could look up, say, show me all the faults, move to the New England fold belt and look at a reverse fault at a location called Bungwall. So now we're looking at a fully texture rendered three dimensional model of a, re of a re reverse fault. We could go to an iconic locality like Marble Bar in the Pilbara. And we could then utilize that um, to um, build a virtual tour. We've got all the resources here for Marble Bar. We haven't yet turned it into a virtual tour. Here's an example of drone imagery. This is a fully texture rendered, somewhat low resolution here, but higher resolution when you see it in reality. This is a fully texture rendered model of the entire outcrop. We can zoom into two elements of the outcrop. We can look in detail at other elements of the outcrop, such as the structural features in the outcrop and hydrothermal features. We can also look at for instance, the three and a half thousand, uh, thousand million year old um, pillow basalts, which are beautifully exposed at Marble Bar. This is an example of a high resolution image obtained on that outcrop, 350 megapixel image, whereby we can see just about things almost at the scale we can see with the hand lens. And finally, we can add to those full spherical panoramas, which give you the context for all of these other objects. So this is just an example of some of the pre-existing um, resources which are available to us to produce tours. 
And hopefully over coming years, we will take some of these resources and produce additional tours for some of these important areas. The other very useful resource is a resource called Sketchfab, which is a repository of 3D models. Now I have a, a large number of 3D models, four and a half thousand 3D models on there, but there are many other organizations, both nationally and internationally, who also have 3D models in, in Sketchfab repositories. So what do we have in Sketchfab? We have the ability to look at any number of geological objects, as you can see scrolling across the screen here. And here are some examples of some of ours. They range in size from um, big things like the entire dolphin open pit on King Island through to fantastic views of the coastal exposures on the eastern side of Mariah Island through to much smaller objects, 15 metres across some Triassic sedimentology right near Hobart and to even smaller objects. Here are some ripple marks in the Rocky Cape group in Western Tasmania, three-dimensional object, totally geometrically correct. We've also digitised one, between one and 2,000 samples from our collection, which are shown here as fully texture rendered models. And these are all available freely to people. So these are some of the resources that we utilise to put together virtual tours. So how then do we go through the process of building a virtual tour? It's actually very, very simple. And once you've managed to collect some of this information, particularly 360 degree views, such as with those cameras that I illustrated before, there are a wide range of software, some of which are virtually free or free, some of which are web-based, some of which are standalone, which enable you to very simply make, make tours. And the one that I, I use, which is called Peno 2 VR, is a piece of software that enables me, it's standalone, so it may, enables me to build my own web applications and then deploy them to any server. Others such as Cooler up on the top left-hand side or Matterport require you to store the information on their web servers. So I'll just give you an idea of how we might go about producing a, three, uh, producing a virtual tour in Pano Tour. So what I've got on the screen at the moment is a tour I'm currently working on, which is a detailed tour of the Dolphin Open Pit Mine on King Island. We're producing this for a master's course, which will happen in September. And we will have many views. There are about 75, 360 degree views down in the bottom here. And we will have um, about 50 three-dimensional models associated with this as well, and thin sections and geochemical analyses, etc. But this is one in progress, but I'll just play the video now to show you what we have. In the tour building software down the bottom, we have load up 360 degree views. As you can see, we have associated with them hotspots. We can place into the view a variety of different hotspots, videos, audio files. Um, we can then um, bring in different types of of objects. This is an ortho image of the dolphin open pit, or we could bring in a flat image. This is the startup screen for that particular tour. And all of those things are then linked. So on the right hand side, you can see the links that I've made, which enable you to navigate through the tour. Each of the little blue dots represents a locality and the lines indicate places you can travel within the tour. Then we can go through and build the tour, which it's doing at the moment and then it will fire it up into a web browser. So here we have that tour that I've just produced in the web browser, and we can now navigate through the mine. We're now on the, on the, um, the bench going, or one of the benches going down towards the previous underground portal. Difficult light conditions when I was there, extreme contrast in light. But this gives you an idea of the process of building a virtual tour. So, I don't really want to spend much more time talking about the mechanics of this, but I can talk in detail in discussions later about how we go about doing this. I'm not the only person doing this in an Australian context. The other person who's doing this in a, in a um, the other person who's mainly doing this in a tertiary education context is Tom Ramondo at the University of South Australia. And Tom produces really well polished tours. Mine are perhaps less polished than Tom's, but perhaps contain more content. Um, so I'll just now cut out of here, ah, if it lets me, I'll cut out of here. And what I'd like to do is to demonstrate now some tours. And I'm gonna do this live. Always a danger when you try and do something like this live to an audience that things will blow up. Hopefully they won't. But what I'm gonna first show you are some examples of tours that we produced for the Australian Earth Science Convention, which happened earlier this year in Hobart. 
when of course it couldn't be attended in, in person. And I'll also show you some examples from a draft tour that I'm still having production of the Savage River Mine. So just let me hide that panel again. And so I'll come here. First of all, we're going to look at the AESC virtual tours. So this is the homepage for the AESC virtual tours. I'm doing this live, we'll go to King Island. Let's first of all go to Cape Wickham at the northern tip of King Island. So here's the front page for the virtual tour of Cape Wickham. And on that front page, we can click here to download a, a map from the Mineral Resources, from Mineral Resources Tasmania. Two of the principal references associated with this tour can be accessed on the right hand side. However, the main way that we might access the tour would be to open the map. So now I can zoom in on a portion of the map at Cape Wickham. I'll first of all show you what it looks like from above. So this is a full spherical panorama obtained with a drone. I really like these images because they give you context. They give you the ability to look at the locality in, in a way that we couldn't do if we were merely standing on the ground. So from here at drone level, I can take you down onto the ground. So now we're on the ground at Cape Wickham. We can, and just to illustrate the um, the resolution of these images, this was acquired with the X-Phase camera, 134 megapixel image. So if I zoom in, we can see Robert Scott, one of my colleagues down on the rock there, and you can see the degree, the detail that's afforded by these sort of images. So in this fully three-dimensional, fully 360 degree view, we can then add links to other localities that I'll explore in a moment, but we can also add in at selected localities um, information. So here we say this is an amphibolite and it's probably pre-S1 or pre, pre the main deformation anyway in this locality. We can also come down onto the outcrop as in this location here and at this location here, if I zoom it out slightly, we have a 3D model. If I click on the 3D model option, it will start to load the 3D model. We'll take it a moment. And you may or may not be able to hear in the background, um, attached to this 3D model is my sonorous voice telling you about this particular model, which illustrates a, a um, D2 fold within their meta sediments at Cape Wickham. But again, fully texture rendered, geographically located, um, you know, view of that, of that rock. It's almost as good, not quite as good as being there, but almost as good as being there. Okay, so that's an example of a 3D model at Cape Wickham. What I might do is now just illustrate some other aspects of some of the things from um, King I Oh, I should have actually shown you something else at Cape Wickham. I meant to do so. There's in addition something called a tour guide that we've put here because there's a lot of information here. There is many, 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 many localities and finding your way around is quite difficult. So what I've created is a tour guide. If you want to go and see, for instance, an early mafic intrusion, then you can click there, bring up the 3D model and play that model again it will have me talking in the background and on this particular model i can click there and it will tell me that that's the s0 s1 fabric or over here that that's a microgranite dike cutting through the early mafic intrusive or oops i can get this in the right orientation or maybe we can come over here and look at pegmatite dike on the margin of the microgranite intrusion so all of these things are possible anything really is possible we can embed any sort of sensible and re realistic and useful object into these three-dimensional models and into the 360 degree views. So let's leave Cape Wickham now and we might go and visit another locality in, um, in King Island. We'll go down to Stokes Point, which are um, you know, around 1300 MA regionally metamorphosed um, lower amphibolite facies metamorphic rocks. And I'll take you to the tour guide here just to show you the degree to which we can render features in the field. So I'll take you to a 3D model of a beautiful example of some large andalusite porphyroblasts and small garnet porphyroblasts in a schist near Stokes Point. And I'll play that model. And in this model, I'll to zoom, it, zoom up to show you the degree to which we can render things. And again, I'm talking about it in the background, but you can see the huge andalusites, laths which are in the S1 foliation, and you can see the small garnet porphyroblasts in the background. So again, we're seeing this, this rock at a level which is comparable to what we would see if we were on our hands and knees. The last example I'd like to show you from King Island 
is an example from the grassy region of King Island, which is also the location where we have the grassy region is the location of the dolphin open pit. And so there's the dolphin open pit in the background, the one on which I'm working at the moment to make a, a more detailed tour. But we can come down to a location on the ground here. And at this location, I've collected a series of samples from the dump. And we've imaged those samples as three-dimensional models. So for instance, if we click on grassy two, we're now going to open up a hand specimen sample to look at a hand specimen at this location. And Again, with me telling you about it in the background, but if we click there, it tells you that those are garnets, grossular garnets in this particular case, or perhaps there is you know, calcite or quartz or whatever you care to label on this sample. So this is a fully texture rendered three dimensional rendition of a sample from the dump at the dolphin mine. So what I've tried to illustrate is how we've produced um, tours for the um, for the AESC and we have a number of other tours of this nature that we've produced for our own applications in education here at the University of Tasmania. I'd like to just finish though by illustrating a tour from the Savage River. Um, this is a tour that's currently in draft case, in draft version, but I'd like to show you a couple of applications. So here, this is more on the basis of what we might do for professional education. So now I can click on a schematic cross section of the Savage River deposit. I can click there in the ore deposit. I can now zoom up on a high resolution reflected light photomicrograph, or I could cut back and click on the sample and bring up a fully texture rendered version of a piece of standard drill core from the ore zone at Savage River. But our ability to do that is not restricted solely to geological objects. That one. We can also do interesting things from a mining perspective. This is very nascent at the moment, but we can come and see the entirety of the Savage River open pit with a 150 megapixel full spherical panorama, which enables us to zoom in to be able to see details of features and annotate features on the model. We can also find the way out. We can also, in this case, show you elements of the mining activity. So in this particular case, I have a 360 degree video of a face shovel in operation at the Savage River mine. The mine were kind enough to allow us to, to latch the camera onto the front of the face shovel. So here you are with a perspective that you otherwise might not be able to have. I can spin around and look at the truck. So I can look back at the operator. I can look down, that's where the camera is. I can look anywhere I like. And this is an example of 360 degree video incorporated into a virtual tour, unfortunately with all the accompanying noise. I'll just get out of that and show you another example. This is an example of 360 video from an underground development drive that they've got at Savage River. And this is the operation of a jumbo. I think it's running at about six times real speed here. So you can see those people don't quite walk that fast, but we can see everything 10 times real speed. I can look back at the operators in their cabin. I can watch the jumbo in operation. This is a location where we could never take our students, where we could never take members of the general public, but we can expose them to it. And finally, one last example to illustrate the operations at Savage River are things like time-lapse photography. So here is time-lapse video showing the operations of the mining on the benches of Savage River. So these, are, I hope, just give you a taste of the sorts of things that we can do, if you like, to make virtual tours more real. And that's really what myself and people like Tom Raimondo at the Uni of South Australia have been striving to do over the last few years, is to make the experience, particularly for our students, more real, so that we can show them a greater diversity of geological objects and a greater diversity of experiences. And I hope that you can appreciate that this has applications beyond just tertiary education, that it has applications in a wide range of different fields. And I might stop there 